Hi, my name is Colin Lightbody, and I'm the president and founder of HR and Labor Guru, Inc. On behalf of the company, I'd like to welcome you to our on-demand webinar series. Before we get into the presentation materials, I'd like to take a few minutes to let you know a bit about our company and also give you some insight into my professional background. First, let's talk about the company. HR and Labor Guru's goals are to provide practical, value-added, human resource and labor solutions to our clients through on-demand webinars, plus training and consulting engagements. Our company specializes in a number of areas, including the following. First is bargaining preparation and strategy formulation for labor negotiations, development of negotiations costing models and bargaining tools, identification of opportunities to reduce and or mitigate rising labor costs, healthcare cost reduction strategies, addressing high unplanned absenteeism, including FMLA in the United States, and finally, HR analytics in terms of building effective analytics teams and identifying and executing high value projects. Next, let's talk about my professional background. I established HR and Labor Guru in 2019 after retiring from Fiat Chrysler Automobiles or FCA with 20 years of service. My last position held at Fiat Chrysler was Director of Labor Economics, People Analytics and Insights and Hourly Attendance at Chrysler World Headquarters in Auburn Hills, Michigan. In terms of labor negotiations, I have over 20 years of union negotiations experience and I've been actively involved in numerous multi-billion dollar deals. While at Fiat Chrysler, I was actively involved in virtually every set of national negotiations in the United States with the United Auto Workers Union since 2003, every set in Canada with Unifor, formerly known as the Canadian Auto Workers Union since 1999, and every set in Mexico with the CTM Union since 2004. My roles and responsibilities ranged from being a bargaining subcommittee chairperson to benefits accounting, labor economics, and labor strategy expert to negotiating with presidents of the national labor unions. In 2007, I participated in the negotiation of the transfer of Chrysler's multi-billion dollar retiree health care obligation to a United Auto Workers Union sponsored health care trust. In addition, over the years, I was actively involved in facilitating several special agreements, including corporate restructuring deals pertaining to shift eliminations, plant divestitures, and plant closures. In my opinion, though, my biggest claim to fame is the fact that over for many years, I provided strategic bargaining guidance and worked directly with the late FCA Chief Executive Officer Sergio Marchioni arguably one of the best negotiators of all time. Also, I was a member of the Mercer Labor Employee Relations Network in the United States for over 10 years. Therefore, I had the distinct pleasure of networking, benchmarking, and sharing best practices with some of the world's top labor executives from multiple industries on topics ranging from absenteeism challenges to labor negotiation strategies. In terms of HR analytics, as head of the People Analytics and insights team at Fiat Chrysler, I directed numerous special studies, including the following, internal labor market maps and employee turnover studies for the salaried workforce, and deep dive studies on topics such as absenteeism and hourly hiring process for the hourly workforce. In addition, I was an active member of Mercer's HR analytics network, known as the Internal Labor Market Network, for over three years in the United States. As a member of this group, I had the opportunity of networking with some of the world's top HR analytics professionals and consultants. We regularly shared stories about growing pains, the challenges, the success stories, and the lessons learned from our unique HR analytics journeys. From an educational perspective, I'm a professional accountant, both a CPA and CA, and I was employed at Deloitte and Touche for 10 years prior to joining Fiat Chrysler. I also hold a Bachelor of Commerce degree with a concentration in accounting and finance from the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, and also hold a Master of Business Administration degree with a concentration in human resources and labor relations from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I'd like to start off by talking about why you should attend this webinar. Rising healthcare costs are one of the most significant challenges facing employers today. There's really no one single silver bullet available to address this highly complex issue. Accordingly, this webinar is intended to provide attendees with a comprehensive analytical approach to identifying key areas of focus 
and strategies to develop practical win-win solutions for employers and employees and their unions. The learning objectives for this module are as follows. We want to develop a high-level understanding of the rising healthcare cost challenges facing employers today. Also, we want to identify the multiple strategies and tools available to mitigate rising healthcare costs. In addition, we'll take a look at a three-step analytical approach to identify key focus areas in order to facilitate potential cost reduction strategies. Also, take a look at a comprehensive strategy to address high cost elements, and you'll see the reduce model that I've pulled together. And finally, we wanna look at developing win-win solutions for both employers and employees and their unions. Who will benefit from this webinar? Basically, any directors or vice presidents uh, in the capacity of human resources, labor relations, or finance, anyone who has an interest in controlling healthcare costs. Also controllers, analytics professionals, healthcare and benefits specialists, even if you're looking at redesigning your current plan, and also current or future labor negotiators, whether or not you're on the union side or on the management side. So as an introduction to this module, I'd like to reiterate again, rising healthcare costs are one of the most significant challenges facing employers today. And this module is designed to assist employers by illustrating how to apply basic analytical procedures to healthcare data in order to identify value-added solutions to rising healthcare costs. So the key segments that are discussed in this module include the following. First, we're gonna take a look at the problem, which is rising healthcare costs. Then we'll look at the challenge from an employee and union expectations perspective. And then we wanna develop an understanding, which is a general overview of plan designs delivery models, clinical programs, tools, etc. It can be very complicated. Then we'll look at the strategy, which is the reduce model that I referred to earlier. There are multiple levers to pull in order to reduce healthcare costs. And then the solution, we'll take a look at the three-step analytics approach. The first topic that we're gonna address is the problem, that is rising healthcare costs. Throughout this webinar, we're gonna speak a lot about unions but really the issues, concepts, and strategies apply in both union and non-union settings. Rising healthcare costs are arguably one of the most talked about subjects during the collective bargaining process. In most cases, it is the second largest labor cost component next to wages. However, unlike wages, healthcare costs are extremely difficult to control, especially in an environment where new, more expensive technologies and procedures, as well as new, high cost specialty drugs are being introduced on a regular basis. In the United States, companies that provide healthcare coverage for employees spend on average over $10,000 per employee per year. Some large employers pay more than double that, often equating to more than $10 per hour worked. It is no wonder that groups of employers such as Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and JP Morgan are working together to find solutions to rising healthcare costs. Another significant problem is just the general lack of employee understanding and or appreciation for healthcare coverage and the associated costs. Therefore, it's extremely important that the company sets the stage with its employees and unions on a regular basis. It is imperative that the company demonstrates the seriousness of rising healthcare costs and to clearly communicate the company's objective of controlling these costs. Firstly, the company should utilize data-driven analysis including statistics on healthcare inflation trends by type of coverage, healthcare costs per employee, employee cost share, and benchmarking where appropriate to make their case. Secondly, the company should provide clear answers to the question, what's in it for the employee? And companies can be very creative here. Here are a few examples of some of the messaging that the company can send to employees and to unions. You know, perhaps the union is looking for investment commitments in order to improve job security, and the company can communicate that healthcare savings can be utilized to fund these new investments. Another point, healthcare savings will improve the company's bottom line financial results. This could potentially increase employees' profit sharing checks if they have a profit sharing model as part of their compensation package. Also, the company can indicate that Rising healthcare costs may preclude the company from meeting employees' current and future wage increase expectations. Healthcare coverage represents a significant portion of the overall compensation and benefits package. So it's fair for the company to indicate that 
investment and sourcing decisions are made based upon all in labor costs and health care benefits are a large part of that. And finally, in unionized environments, the company should invite the union to participate in brainstorming sessions where the two parties generate ideas to reduce health care costs and or mitigate health care inflation. Clearly, some ideas such as cutting health care benefits or increasing employee cost share will not be popular with the union. However, writing these unpopular ideas on the board may encourage the union to consider less intrusive cost cutting ideas such as modifying health care delivery models or plan design changes that facilitate employee consumerism. And we'll talk about these things later in the module. It's also important to note here that this issue of healthcare inflation and rising healthcare costs is definitely a bigger issue in the United States versus Canada, since in the United States, uh, private funding is in place for hospital, surgical, and medical coverage, whereas in Canada, it's primarily covered through the government programs. Next, we'll turn our attention to the challenge, which is employee and union expectations. Healthcare coverage is typically considered a sacred cow by employees and unions. And unions are in the business of protecting their members, so in most bargaining scenarios, unions will insist upon the following guiding principles. First, no reduction in the employee standard of living via increases in employee health care cost share. Second, want to maintain and or improve health care coverage. Third, want to maintain or improve the quality of health care services. And finally, fourth, want to maintain employee choice. Employees want to decide where they go to get their health care. And this can be a significant challenge for companies to reduce and or mitigate rising health care costs while managing these employee expectations. But the good news, as we'll see later, is that there are opportunities. Companies offer different types of coverage. The following are the most common in the United States, and these are ranked in typical order of your total dollar spend. First is hospital, surgical, and medical coverage. Second, prescription drug coverage. Third, dental coverage. Fourth, vision coverage. And then other, which includes things like paramedical coverage. For each type of coverage, employers or employers and unions must together develop a detailed plan design, which includes the following four key elements. Coverage specifications, employee cost share, delivery models, and clinical programs. And in turn, we're gonna talk about each one of these elements. It's important to note here that analytics professionals must work closely with their healthcare subject matter experts, both internal and external, to obtain a solid understanding of the plan designs, issues and opportunities, and also they must all respect employee privacy laws. The first topic of discussion is plan coverage specifications. There are numerous design elements that must be considered for each type of benefit, including the following, extent of coverage, so for example, what specific procedures are covered under the dental plan? Does it include dental exams, dental cleanings, fillings, x-rays, orthodontics, things of that nature? The second element are limits. You know, are there dollar limits for certain dental procedures? Are there lifetime maximums for orthodontics? Third element is frequency. Does the plan cover a dental exam once every 12 months? or is it every six months or 18 months? And then the last thing is eligibility rules. It's not unusual for employees to have a one to five year waiting period before becoming eligible for certain benefits such as dental and vision coverage. The second main plan design consideration element is employee cost share. In simple terms, employee cost share represents the cost of the employee to have and to use the healthcare plan. From an employer perspective, the employee cost share is essential to mitigating health care costs. From a strategic perspective, in general, employers should strive to direct employees to lower cost delivery models via lower cost share and provide disincentives to employees via high cost share who prefer to utilize higher cost delivery models. Unions will typically support these strategies provided that the quality of health care services are comparable. Union members are still provided with a choice one of their guiding principles, despite the fact that they may be required to pay more for it. There are four basic employee cost share alternatives. Most healthcare plan designs utilize a combination of these options. Premiums. Premiums are typically fixed dollar amounts provided by the employee to the company 
through regular payroll deductions. Premiums are normally scaled depending on the number of employee family members covered. For example, on a monthly basis for a single employee, maybe $50 per month. For employee plus spouse, maybe $100 per month. And for employee plus family coverage would be $150 per month. Premiums are considered to be intrusive by unions as there are payments to have the health care plan regardless of use. The second element are deductibles. Deductibles represent fixed dollar amounts paid by an employee before the health care insurance pays. Deductibles are considered less intrusive than premiums since they are only paid in the event of utilization of the health care benefit. From a management perspective, an advantage of deductibles is that the high deductible plans often make employees think twice before utilizing health care benefits as they are responsible for paying 100% of the first X dollars before the company paid insurance kicks in. These deductibles are similar in nature to deductibles in your automobile or home insurance policies. The third type are co-payments. Co-payments or co-pays represent a fixed amount per service paid by the employee. Co-payments are an excellent strategic tool for employers to implement in order to encourage employees to utilize lower cost delivery models. For example, employers trying to direct employees who require non-emergent care to lower cost family physicians may have an office visit copay of $35 versus a $100 emergency room copay for employees who elect to visit a higher cost hospital ER. So there's an economic incentive for the employees to go and see their family physician before going to the ER. Union and management can create another opportunity for employees to demonstrate consumerism and assist the company in reducing costs. For example, the employees can create a tiered prescription drug copayment structure, such as perhaps there's a $10 copayment for generic drugs, a $40 copayment for preferred brand drugs, and a $90 copayment for non-preferred brand drugs. The, the, the idea here is here to send people to the generic equivalents where possible through a $10 copay versus a $90 copayment for non-preferred brand drugs. And lastly, coinsurance. Coinsurance is a cautionary alternative where the employee is responsible for paying a fixed percentage of the healthcare service. And coinsurance may be preferable to copayments in cases where healthcare services are highly inflationary. The best way to illustrate this concept is by looking at an example. Let's look at the chart on the next slide. Assume that the average cost for a prescription drug is $50 and a year-over-year -year inflation rate on drugs is 10%. So on the left side of the chart, Company A has negotiated a prescription drug co-payment of $5 and co Company B on the right-hand side of the chart has negotiated prescription drug co-insurance of 10%. As you can see, in year one of the contract, both companies received the same cost share from the employee, $5 or 10% of $50, same thing. However, in year two of the contract, company B is better off than company A as it will receive a $5.50 or 10% cost share on an inflation adjusted prescription cost of $55. Conversely, in year two, company A with the co-payment approach will only receive $5, which represents 9.1% or $5 on $55 cost share. Another potential advantage of co-insurance versus co-payments is that coinsurance by its very nature provides inflation protection for the targeted cost share and therefore may not require adjustment in each contract. On the other hand, copayments may require increases in order for the targeted cost share to keep up with inflation and accordingly may need to be renegotiated every set of bargaining. So this is a good example of how plan design can help save the company money on healthcare costs. The third major plan design element that we're going to look at is delivery models. In the United States, there are numerous delivery models that are available to companies either on their own, in the case of on-site, near-site clinics with strategic partners, or through a third-party benefit administrator. Traditionally, most companies utilize broad-based and or narrow-based networks for delivery of healthcare services. A broad-based network is where employees have more or less unrestricted access to healthcare services available to them, subject, of course, to plan design limitations. In contrast, a narrow network is where the scope of the network is limited. Certain healthcare providers are excluded based on quality and or financial metrics. Recently, 
In order to address rising healthcare costs, companies are utilizing alternative delivery models such as direct contracting, accountable care organizations or ACOs, on-site, near-site clinics, and telemedicine. In these cases, savings are often generated due to economies of scale, by utilizing lower overhead providers, or by simply taking out the middleman. With direct contracting and affordable care organizations, these de delivery models are developed when the company and or third-party benefit administrators contract directly with local health systems to guarantee desired clinical outcomes and financial targets. On-site, near-site clinics are where more and more companies are creating their own clinics, normally with a strategic partner, in order to reduce healthcare costs. The scope of these clinics range from having an on-site pharmacy to full-service clinics that offer pharmacies, dentists, family physicians, physiotherapy, etc. These clinics typically offer more convenience to employees due to the proximity to their work locations. In addition, employee cost share is lower as the company in theory should be saving money due to taking out the middleman. Some of these clinics are claiming healthcare savings of up to 30% versus the cost of traditional delivery models. Telemedicine is designed for non-emergent situations where the employee contracts a doctor via video call to discuss symptoms and where appropriate, the doctor may be able to diagnose the patient immediately or refer them for further examination. It is considered a convenient, lower cost healthcare delivery model. There are both advantages and disadvantages to each of these approaches, so it's important to work with your benefits administrators to understand what delivery models are the most efficient and cost effective for your particular organization. The next slide shows an illustration of delivery model choice. As indicated previously, one of the guiding principles of the union is to ensure that employees have a choice when it comes to their health care. Therefore, it is often important that employees are given a choice, but from a company perspective, the union must understand that in order to be competitive, higher cost delivery models come with a higher cost share for employees who elect to use them. In this chart, the chart illustrates a model where employees have health care delivery model choices, which as mentioned, uh, union preference. However, higher cost delivery mechanisms have higher employee cost share percentages associated with them. But this approach encourages employee consumerism while respecting employee choice. I mean, if you look at the illustration, the target, the bullseye is where you want to be from the employer perspective. Low cost delivery models, telemedicine, things like on-site clinics, where the cost share is lower for employees, 10%. If you look at the next ring, the white ring is a moderate cost delivery model. Things like narrow networks where the cost share is 20%. And then the outer ring are high cost delivery models where employees have a choice to go, but they're gonna pay more. The broad network may have a cost share of 40%. So this is just an illustration of the way that you can design your program. The next major plan design element that we're gonna discuss is clinical programs. Clinical programs represent opportunities for companies to manage healthcare costs while maintaining or sometimes even improving the quality of care for the union member or employee. Examples of clinical programs are as follows. Mandatory disease management. Mandatory disease management provisions may be appropriate where employees are in certain high risk health situations and adherence to healthcare providers directions are critical for both positive health outcomes and cost containment. It is wise for employers to insist on this provision for certain conditions so that employees are held accountable for the high cost of treatments. Another example is the drug formulary. Companies implement drug formulary provisions in order to contain rising prescription drug costs. With the drug formulary, the company is able to control what drugs are covered under the prescription drug plan. Any new drugs have to be approved in advance of being added to the formulary. Another option are centers of excellence. Center of of excellence provisions facilitate potential win-win situations for both the union and management. Third-party benefit administrators are usually able to identify the hospitals with the best overall health outcomes for certain procedures in the general labor market area. Accordingly, the hospitals with the best track record for positive health outcomes are selected as the centers of excellence for those respective procedures. Heart bypass surgeries along with hip and knee replacements are typical examples of procedures that would be identified for centers of excellence. In theory, union members or employees would enjoy higher quality healthcare services while the company reduces costs due to fewer complications 
and potentially lower fees from the centers of excellence hospitals due to economies of scale. The last one we're going to talk about is reference-based pricing. Reference-based pricing provisions provide an excellent opportunity to reduce costs while satisfying the union's objectives of maintaining employee choice and quality of care. Typical procedures that are earmarked for reference-based pricing are colonoscopies as well as laboratory and radiological procedures. Right or wrong, the common denominator for these procedures is that they are all considered to be somewhat generic in the sense that the quality of care is seen to be relatively the same regardless of where the procedure is performed. Accordingly, with that said, the primary focus of reference-based pricing is on cost versus quality because we're assuming that quality is the same. This is almost the complete opposite situation or approach to the centers of excellence concept that we discussed earlier. The best way to illustrate the concept of reference-based pricing is to look at an example. So let's look at the chart on the next slide. As you can see, the chart depicts the cost of what's characterized as a routine procedure. For example, an MRI or a colonoscopy, etc. And it assumes that the quality of the service is consistent from one hospital to another. Well, you can see the vast array of prices here. Hospital A ranges from $900 all the way up to hospital F at $1,800 for that same procedure. Again, assuming that the quality of service is consistent. So for in this example, the company would set the reference price at a certain amount, probably some percentile of the uh, average cost in the region or the labor market area. So in this case, let's assume the reference price was set at $1,200. The company will pay up to $1,200 for the procedure, and then the employee would be responsible for any additional costs so if the example, if the employee selected hospital F, the company would pick up the first $1,200 and then the employee would be responsible for paying the additional $600 to hospital F. The advantages here is it reduces employer costs by encouraging employee consumerism. And then from an employee perspective, you're retaining the quality of care and you're still giving the employees choice. So this is another example where plan design choices can have a positive impact for both the company and employees. And finally, the last plan design element that I'd like to talk about are other cost mitigation tools and strategies. Over the years, I've learned that there are many innovative strategies and tools that can be considered in an attempt to mitigate overall healthcare costs. Some of the more common and effective concepts are discussed as follows. Wellness programs. Wellness programs may be considered a win-win opportunity for both the union and management or employees. Most wellness programs include some form of annual biomedical testing and health risk questionnaire for the employee and or spouse. Biomedical testing often includes measurements of the following indicators, body mass index or BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, and also blood sugar or glucose. From an employee perspective, these tests are useful as they may identify health risks and or provide an early signal for chronic conditions such as diabetes and heart disease. In many cases, this early detection may provide a wake-up call to employees and encourage them to embrace a more active, healthy lifestyle. From an employer perspective, this potential change in employee behavior will likely translate into lower lifetime health care costs for these employees, whether as an active employee or as a retiree. Participation in wellness programs are normally voluntary. However, employers typically encourage employees to participate in wellness programs by either providing some sort of credits for participating or by charging them a higher cost share, for example, a higher monthly premium if they decide not to participate. Another tool is smoker premiums. In the case of smoker premiums, where employees and or spouses attest that they are smokers, they are typically charged a higher cost share due to what is considered a higher health risk. Another option are spousal surcharges. A spousal surcharge is considered when an employee's spouse is working and has access to his or her employer's health care benefits but decides to opt out of coverage, presumably to avoid paying monthly premiums. Normally, the spouse's health care plan would be the first payer for health care claims incurred personally and perhaps even by their dependents, depends on the birthday rule. However, in this case, the spouse has no coverage and accordingly, the employee's company would be liable for all health care claims for the spouse and dependents, assuming that the employee elected family coverage. To help alleviate these costs, 
Many companies are now charging an annual spousal surcharge, for example, $1,000 in cases where their spouse has opted out of their coverage. Another option is pay provider versus pay subscribers. There are two basic ways for the company or its third-party benefits administrator to pay for an employee's healthcare service, namely pay provider and pay subscriber. Under a pay provider model, the healthcare provider presents a billing net of the appropriate cost share collected from the employee to the company or its third-party benefits administrator, and then the claim is adjudicated and paid directly to the healthcare provider. Under a paid subscriber model, on the other hand, the healthcare provider bills the employee directly for the entire cost of the service. The employee in turn submits a healthcare claim to the company or third party administrator for reimbursement. The claim is then adjudicated in the amount, again, net of the appropriate cost share, is paid to the employee or to the subscriber. Unions and employees, often even employers, typically prefer a pay provider model due to its simplicity and convenience. Employees in particular appreciate the fact that other than cost share amounts, there is no out-of-pocket for them, whereas they would have to wait for reimbursement under a pay subscriber model. Here's the potential opportunity. I was once told by an executive at an unnamed third-party administrator that healthcare services costs per claim were approximately 5% lower in pay subscriber models versus pay provider models. The executive's theory was that healthcare professionals are less likely to either fully charge or overcharge in situations where their patient is billed directly and has to pay the full amount up front. I have no evidence to prove this theory, but the rationale does seem plausible, if not interesting. For a potential savings of 5%, it would seem appropriate to at least have this conversation with your benefits administrators. If this phenomenon holds true, the union may be interested in the pay subscriber model as well if there was some sort of gain sharing opportunity. Next, we'll talk about transparency tools. In this age of big data and workforce analytics, third-party benefits administrators and benefits consultants alike are in the business of providing new tools to companies in order to help manage rising healthcare costs. One of the most interesting developments are transparency tools. Transparency tools are developed by consultants utilizing historical healthcare data in particularly geographic areas for many different lines of business. Employees are provided with access to this data via these transparency tools and can compare items such as costs for, spe for specific healthcare services from one provider to the next. From an employer perspective, transparency tools have the ability to make employees better healthcare consumers, particularly when it benefits them, as illustrated in this example. Let's refer back to the reference-based pricing example that we discussed earlier. So an employee who requires a hip MRI could utilize this transparency tool to see that while the reference price for the hip MRI is $1,200, Hospital A could perform it for $900, so there's a differential of $300. Assuming that there's a 20% coinsurance charge for this procedure, the employee could save $60, which would be the differential of $300 at 20% if the, he or she elected to go to the lower cost hospital. In addition, the company would save $240 or 80% of the $300, creating a win-win situation for both parties. Let's refer back to the reference-based pricing example that we discussed early in the chapter. The last tool we're going to discuss is the concierge approach. This approach is becoming more and more popular. In this case, the employee is provided with a 24-hour phone number to call to assist in seeking medical treatment. After listening to the employee's medical symptoms, the trained concierge would appropriately triage the employee and direct him or her to the appropriate health care delivery model. In theory, this may be beneficial to both the employer and employee. In a situation where an employee is directed to utilize telemedicine versus what was planned to be an emergency room visit, the employer will save money due to utilization of a lower cost provider. In addition, the employee will likely save money as well due to lower cost share associated with the telemedicine call versus an ER visit, not to mention the time that they will likely save by not having to travel to the hospital. So as you can see, there are many, many cost mitigation tools available to help reduce healthcare costs. So now that we have a basic understanding of plan designs, delivery models, clinical programs, and tools, it's time to turn our attention to a couple of other matters. 
First, we're going to take a look at some potential strategies, and we're going to consider the reduced model that we're going to present in the next couple of slides. Also, we'll have the opportunity to look at potential solutions, and we'll utilize a basic three-step analytics approach to pinpoint focus areas and to help develop targeted solutions. And now we're going to turn our attention to the strategy. And in this case, we've developed a reduced model for potential solutions to reduce healthcare costs. It's basically a consolidation of all of the things that you have now in your toolbox associated with plan design, cost mitigation tools, etc. So we'll take our time now and go through them in order. The first opportunity, the R, is to review your healthcare plan designs and look, consider modifications to plan coverage specifications, things like tightening eligibility rules and things of that nature. The second element, the E, is, stands for employee cost share. And here we want to minimize intrusiveness by focusing on employee consumerism initiatives. For example, generic versus brand name drugs have a lower copay for those. Or also think of the example where we looked at co a 10% co-insurance that company B had versus a $5 copay that company A had. The third element, D, is delivery models. You want to consider and encourage less expensive alternatives. For example, telemedicine versus ER visits or narrow networks versus broad networks. The fourth item, the U, is to utilize clinical programs to help manage costs while striving to maintain quality of care. And we saw in our reference-based pricing example where employees can go for things like colonoscopies and MRIs and things like that where the quality is fairly consistent and the costs are lower by being just being good consumers. Fifth item, C, is cost mitigation tools and strategies. Take advantage of these opportunities where possible. Encourage employees to utilize transparency tools so that they can save themselves some money in terms of cost share. And finally, E is examine opportunities to mitigate retiree health care obligations. While we didn't really talk about that a lot, there are some opportunities here as well by converting, perhaps for future new hires, to def defined contribution plans for retiree health care or pensions and so on versus defined benefit plans. And finally, we're going to talk about the solution. And we're going to focus on a three-step process to help reduce healthcare costs. So step one is focus. In this case, we're gonna conduct a deep dive analysis on your healthcare cost data in order to identify areas of focus. Step two, as we'll see, is drill down. So after focusing your attention, we're gonna drill down on the areas of focus in order to identify specific high dollar medical procedures or high dollar drugs, medical conditions, delivery models, or groups of employees that require attention. And in this case, we're going to utilize stratification tools. For example, we're going to conduct analysis by type of procedure, by service provider, by employee. And what you'll find is often the 80-20 rule often applies. So in this case, 20% of the employees or 20% of the medical procedures drive 80% of the costs in, this, in those categories. And again, we must always respect employee privacy laws. And then step three is to develop solutions. So after you've had the chance to focus and drill down, we're gonna develop potential solutions to address the high dollar items identified in the areas of focus above. And we, we've already seen that there are numerous plan design modifications and strategies and tools that we have to work with to make that happen. So let's take a look at step one of the solution. And that step one is to focus. So we're gonna conduct a deep dive analysis on your healthcare cost data in order to identify areas of focus. So as you can see in the chart, this is more of a conceptual chart. You wanna lay out all your different types of benefits that you have. So the first column is hospital, surgical, medical, then prescription drugs, then dental, then vision, then other. And you wanna kinda of lay out your total spend. Are they considered to be high, medium, or low? And annual inflation, are they high, medium, or low? And Start at the 50,000 foot level, level, look at hospital, surgical, medical on its own, and then maybe you break it down further into kind of routine and non-routine procedures. And same with drugs, perhaps you break it down into maintenance drugs or specialty drugs and so on. So start at the 50,000 foot level, see where your initial focus should be. And it should always be on healthcare elements that represent uh, either a higher percentage of total spend 
and or a high annual inflation rates. So in this case, you can see that in most cases for companies, their total spend, the highest amount in the US is on hospital surgical medical things. And historically, prescription drugs due to specialty drugs have the highest annual inflation rate. So now we're gonna move from a conceptual chart down to a more detailed chart. And as you can see, the stratification charts and these analytical tools are very, very helpful in identifying areas of focus. So one of the most powerful tools is stratification. And by stratifying healthcare costs by type of benefit and looking at year over year inflation, management can quickly assess where to focus their efforts. So this table illustrates a very basic stratification model that can be developed quite easily by management. And after looking at this table, one can easily see the primary focus should be on hospital surgical med medical coverage since it represents 70% of the overall healthcare spend and prescription drugs should be the secondary focus, not only since the second highest spend, but also due to the 10% year over year inflation rate. So this is the type of table that you wanna develop in order to focus your efforts. So now let's turn our attention to step two, drill down. At this point, we wanna drill down on the areas of focus in order to identify specific high dollar elements that require attention. For example, we wanna stratify by the type of medical procedure or the type of drug, by the medical condition, look at the healthcare delivery model, or perhaps the employee or groups of employees. And as mentioned previously, we always wanna utilize stratification tools and often the 80-20 rule applies. That is 20% of the employees or 20% of the procedures drive 80% of the costs. And again, as usual, we must respect employee privacy laws. So the next slide gets into more detail. And this is an illustration of the solution for focus area one that we identified earlier, hospital surgical medical. So if you take a look at the top, you've got at a high level, you've got in the blue box, hospital surgical medical. And then what you wanna do is you wanna drill down further. You wanna segregate by type of procedure and identify high dollar areas. So in this case, I segregated into routine procedures on the left in green and non-routine procedures or conditions on the right in red. So in terms of more drill down, if you look at the bubble up above routine procedures, you can drill down even deeper into things like laboratory tests or radiological tests or colonoscopies. And then on the right hand side for non-routine procedures, you can segregate by things like heart bypass surgery or chronic conditions. And then once you've identified and, and broken out those separate groupings, you can drill down even further and identify high cost delivery models or high cost employees and look at things even deeper. And when you're looking at these sort of things, you wanna ask some real probing questions. For example, why are certain hospitals or clinics more expensive than others for the same procedure? Is it a price issue or is there a quality issue? Are there complications and additional rework that has to be done in order to uh, have a satisfactory condition? Why are costs so high for certain employees? Are they utilizing the appropriate healthcare providers? For example, are they going and doing emergency room visits for non-emergent care? Things of that nature. Also questions you can ask are employees with chronic conditions, for example, heart disease, diabetes, etc., taking their medical conditions seriously. So these are the types of conditions, and this is the type of drill down that you need to do in order to focus your attention. And it can be done almost in any order. You can pick and choose how you wanna segregate your, your data, but just segregate it in some logical form, whether it's routine and non-routine procedures or high dollar models or high dollar employees. It doesn't matter which route you take, as long as you just keep focusing deeper and deeper, you can go in whatever order you please. So the next chart looks at focus area two that we uh, described earlier, it's prescription drugs. So again, at the top of the chart in blue, you know, you wanna start off at the, at the high level, what are your prescription drug costs? And then again, same process as before, you wanna segregate your population. In this case, I segregated by type of drugs and then identified high dollar areas from there. So on the left in the green box, I looked at standard drugs, which would be things like maintenance drugs and so on. And you can drill down deeper into different categories if you please. And then on the right side, we look at things in the red box, 
non-standard drugs. So in this case, I've given a couple examples. One may be specialty drugs, the other may be lifestyle drugs, for example, erectile dysfunction drugs, things of that nature. And then as you can see, again, you're gonna drill down further and identify high cost items, whether it be high cost prescriptions or high cost employees and so on and so forth. Again, you can pick and choose how you wanna disaggregate your data, but the, the idea here is to focus and find out what the co high cost elements are and, and segregate things that make sense for your type of business. So again, you wanna ask probing questions. Are drugs being dispensed in the most cost-effective manner? Maintenance drugs, do we have sufficient supplies that are being provided to employees on a regular basis, like 90-day, 120-day supplies, and so on? Uh, are you utilizing step therapy for your drugs? Are generic drugs being utilized to their full potential? And if not, should something be done to the co-pays or co-insurance to encourage that? Also, should you consider increasing employee cost share for certain drugs? or perhaps eliminate coverage for certain drugs. So these are the types of probing questions that you can get into. And these are just examples. The sky's the limit in terms of the number of questions that you can be asking. And now we'll turn our focus to the final step. Step three, develop solutions. In the next few slides, potential cost mitigation opportunities will be highlighted for both focus areas, uh, hospital, surgical, medical, and for prescription drugs as well. You have to remember there's no silver bullet and here we're going to utilize stratification techniques to identify key focus areas and then the reduce model to design a comprehensive approach to address these high cost elements. We also must remember that change is difficult for employees and unions and we must try to develop win-win solutions that for the most part minimize employee intrusiveness, maintain or improve the quality of care, provide employee choice, recognizing of course that employee cost share may be higher in many cases and then, as we've seen many, many times, we want to encourage employee consumerism. So in each of these cases, you have to expect pushback from employees and expect pushback from unions as well. Changes may take time and application of future hires may be your path of least resistance. You may have to grandfather your existing employees for certain elements of plan design, but in many cases, unions are open to changing plan designs for future new hires. So let's take a look at some example solutions. And first we're gonna look at a slide that looks at focus area number one, hospital, surgical, medical. And it focuses at this point on the high cost procedures and or providers. So on the left hand side of this chart, you can see the observation. And then on the right hand side, we've got some potential cost mitigation opportunities. Now this isn't all inclusive. These are just some ideas that we've already talked about as part of the uh, module. So the first, first category are routine procedures. For example, laboratory and radiological tests like MRIs, colonoscopies, etc. And there are some situations where we see significant pricing discrepancies from one hospital or clinic to another for the same procedure. And again, this you'll find through your drill down. So what are some of the potential cost mitigation opportunities? The first one would be Reference-based pricing. Think back to the example that we had of hospital A charging $900 all the way to the highest hospital charging, you know, over $2,000 for the same procedure and put a reference-based price in there for $1,200. So again, you're giving employees choice, but they're going to have to pay if they want to go to the higher priced hospital. Another idea may be to develop narrow networks where you are encouraging employees to go to hospitals or clinics where you've negotiated a better deal. And thirdly, another thing is to implement transparency tools so that employees can take a look and see where the high dollar or low dollar hospitals with the same you know, quality of care, et cetera, are available so that they can make informed decisions and practice employee consumerism. And as we saw earlier, the employee may save some money in terms of their cost share and as well the employer may save some money. So that's a good one. And then the next next issue is non-routine procedures. Things like heart bypass surgery and things where you have significant pricing discrepancies again from one hospital clinic to another. And in this case, maybe it's potentially due to quality of care issues. Maybe certain hospitals have more complications for heart bypass surgery and it may make sense to someone send an employee to a more expensive hospital if it gets fixed first visit. 
rather than going back and having complications and having to go back again and it may end up costing more in the long run. So in some, some opportunities for cost mitigation are you know having pre-approval for surgeries, having centers of excellence. So if you identify a hospital that you know your third party administrator has indicated has uh, excellent quality for things like heart bypass surgery, maybe you contract with them. Again, narrow networks may make sense. And again, transparency tools may make sense to implement as well. So these are just some ideas for that. The next slide, again, looking at solutions. Again, this is for focus area number one, hospital, surgical, medical. But in this case, we're looking at high cost employees. So the first thing we're gonna look at is emergency room. For example, there is significant cost due to utilization of emergency room for non-emergent care, or you have frequent flyers, people who go to the emergency room all the time rather than, rather than going to their own family physician. So there are a number of things that you can do. Ideas include increase the employee cost share for emergency room visits and make it more cost beneficial for them to do, go and see their family doctor. Address non-emergent care concerns. If people continue to go to emergency for non-emergent care, maybe there are provisions that you have that can penalize them for doing so, or maybe you just refuse to pay after a certain point in time. Concierge services are another effective thing to do. Um, you know, they can call, call the concierge 24 hours and that concierge will triage them and send them to the appropriate health delivery model. Uh, telemedicine is another thing. And again, we spoke about that. We're talking about concierge. And then the next thing to look at is perhaps chronic conditions. Some employees may not be adhering to prescribed medicine or therapies or behaviors. And in this case, if you have people that are, are repeatedly not doing the right things that their specialists are advising to do, maybe there's a mandatory disease management provision put into the benefit plan design uh, where employees are required to do that. If not, they're cut off or they have to pay higher cost share, things of that nature. And wellness programs are also another good, good idea. It's more of a long-term solution, but over the long term, if people participate, you may avoid some costs in the future. And also, in looking at high cost delivery models, some employees may consistently utilize higher cost delivery models. And again, in these are cases where you want to encourage employee consumerism. You know, you can modify the employee cost share, reference-based pricing, as we mentioned earlier, telemedicine, transparency tools, and again, concierge services may be another solution there. And then the next chart looks at solutions for focus area two, prescription drugs. So this, this chart looks at both high cost drugs or prescriptions and also high cost employees. So the first, the first line for high cost drugs, significant costs related to certain drugs, for example, specialty drugs, new drugs, et cetera, and so on. So here there are a few potential cost mitigation opportunities related to these high cost drugs. One is the drug formulary where any new drugs and so on have to be approved prior to being offered to employees, step therapy, and also perhaps limiting quantities in order to save costs. The next category is lifestyle drugs. For example, erectile dysfunction drugs where there's high utilization. I mean, some companies are starting to consider limiting or eliminating coverage for these types of drugs, or failing that can also increase employee cost share because they are lifestyle drugs and they aren't required for someone's survival. Next, high cost employees. Certain employees have higher utilization and costs. In this case, we just want to encourage employee consumerism. We've indicated a lot of different play, plays there. One is multi-tiered cost share, where you have you know, $10 for a copay for generic drugs versus perhaps $50 for brand name, etc. In this case, you're just trying to encourage employee consumerism in order to keep costs down. So as you can see, this three-step analytical process is a great solution to reduce healthcare costs. Again, step one, you're trying to focus your attention on what matters most. Step two, is where you wanna drill down onto your high dollar amounts, whether they be medical procedures, delivery models, or employees, etc. And it's important to use stratification tools in order to see where to focus. And then finally, we develop solutions by utilizing a reduced model where we have numerous plan design modifications, strategies, and tools to work with. I'd like to take a few minutes to summarize this healthcare analytics module. First point I'd like to make is that 
Healthcare is a high cost yet underappreciated employee benefit. And as such, it's very important that employees must communicate the value and cost of healthcare to employees regularly. As we've seen, stratification and analysis of your healthcare data can help focus your attention on what matters most. And we've also seen by utilizing the reduce model, there are numerous opportunities to mitigate and or reduce rising healthcare costs. Plan design is extremely important. Think of the co-insurance versus co-payment example. Alternative delivery models exist and you wanna direct employees to lower cost alternatives via lower employee cost share and vice versa. Also, clinical programs and cost mitigation tools can help manage costs. The other point to note is that win-win solutions are possible with unions. Employee consumerism initiatives can significantly reduce costs while minimizing employee intrusiveness. This approach may allow companies to maintain existing healthcare coverage, continue to provide employees with choice, and potentially fund new economics in contract negotiations with the union. And finally, keep in mind that future new hires may represent the most likely opportunity for change. They, have, they are not there yet to ratify uh, contracts, and if you grandfather existing employees, this may be the best approach to take. Thank you for taking the time to participate in our on-demand webinar today. I am pleased to inform you that HR and Labor Guru has three distinct on-demand webinar series with a total of seven modules as follows. First, we have the Reduce Your Labor Cost series, and there are two modules in this series. Secondly, we have the Bargaining Preparation series, and again, there are two modules in this series. And finally, we have the HR Analytics series, and there are three modules in this particular series. I would like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the content in the respective series. In a few instances, certain strategic concepts are introduced at a high level in one module, and then for those of you who are interested, presented in a deeper dive format in another module. I will attempt to highlight these situations as I quickly walk you through the module highlights. First, let's talk about the Reduce Your Labor Cost series. These modules will appeal to anyone interested in reducing their labor costs, whether you're an HR or labor professional looking to redesign your compensation and benefit plans, preparing for negotiations with the union, or simply a corporate controller looking for opportunities to reduce labor costs. Part one of the Reduce Your Labor Cost series deals with compensation and workforce composition. In this series, you'll develop an in-depth understanding of the numerous financial elements that should be considered when calculating all in labor costs. Also, you get an understanding of several internal and external factors to take into consideration when contemplating modifications to compensation. Also, compare and contrast employee or union versus company preferences with respect to compensation alternatives to recognize strategic opportunities to offer lump sums and or variable compensation versus fixed wage increases. And finally, in this module, you'll obtain a clear understanding of how changes to a company's workforce composition can be one of the most union-friendly opportunities to significantly reduce and or mitigate rising all-in labor costs over time. In contrast, part two of the Reduce Your Labor Cost series deals primarily with healthcare, pensions, and other employee benefits. In this module, you'll gain an appreciation for the importance of plan design decisions in driving overall employee healthcare costs. You look at things like employee cost share, delivery models, and clinical programs. Also, you look at the identification of the multiple levers, strategies, and tools available to mitigate rising healthcare costs. Also, we'll take a look at a three-step analytical approach to identify key focus areas in order to facilitate potential cost reduction strategies for healthcare. And also, we'll have a comprehensive strategy to address high-cost healthcare elements using a reduced model. And we'll also take a look at developing win-win healthcare solutions for both employers and employees or their unions. In addition, you'll understand cost mitigation strategies for other employee benefits, including pensions, disability, life insurance, paid time off, and retiree benefits. And finally, learn about proven strategies aimed at reducing other post-employment benefit obligations and costs related to retiree benefits. Secondly, let's talk about the bargaining preparation and strategy formulation series. These modules will appeal to anyone looking for practical guidance relative to preparing for bargaining with the union, whether you're a member of the actual negotiations team or a member of one of the support teams, such as finance or public relations. Most of the content, particularly with respect to strategy formulation, will appeal to all levels of an organization.
including directors and vice presidents. Part one of this series is called Bargaining Preparation. This module outlines the key negotiations preparation activities that should be performed from 12 to 18 months in advance of bargaining right through to opening day. The key areas of focus for bargainers typically include the following, a bargaining environment assessment, development of a robust internal governance process, development of negotiations costing models, formulation of bargaining strategy, and finally creation of a comprehensive communication strategy. And all these elements are dealt with in this module. While negotiations, costing models, and strategy formulation are presented at a high level in part one, for those of you interested in more of a deep dive, I would highly recommend looking at part two in this series as well. Part two is called Negotiations, Costing Models, and Strategy Formulation. In this module, you'll develop an in-depth understanding of the numerous financial elements that should be considered when calculating all in labor costs and creating negotiations costing models. You'll also obtain a clear understanding of how to develop a dynamic cost model by utilizing a simple three-step approach. In addition, you'll learn how to develop practical bargaining tools that can be utilized to improve efficiencies when costing out union demands and management proposals, develop alternative economic offers, and assist in formulating overall bargaining strategy. As well, you'll learn how to develop a simple matrix that will assist the company in identifying potential win-win solutions with the union. And finally, you'll understand the importance of developing a comprehensive economic offer playbook by consolidating input from the various subcommittees. And finally, let's talk about the HR Analytics series. These modules will appeal to a wide variety of professionals, including those in the analytics, finance, HR, and labor relations fields. Part one of this series is entitled, Building a Value-Added HR Analytics Function. In this module, you'll take a look at the structure, roles, and responsibilities of an effective HR analytics team. We'll also talk about how to address common challenges that companies face in growing their HR analytics function. We'll identify quick wins and value-added projects that will appeal to both HR business partners, and HR centers of excellence. And finally, we'll take a look at an introduction to predictive analytics through an illustration of a six-step process. Part two of the HR analytics series is called Breaking the HR Analytics Paradigm. We're gonna be looking at hourly workforce data. First thing we're gonna look at is recognizing the low-hanging fruit associated with the examination of hourly workforce data. We're gonna focus on operational and cost savings opportunities associated with three distinct areas. First, absenteeism, including family medical leave act in the United States. Secondly, the hourly hiring process. And thirdly, hourly employee payroll data. And the final module in this series is part three that deals with healthcare analytics. We're gonna gain an appreciation for the importance of plan design decisions in driving overall employer healthcare costs. Look at things such as employee cost share, delivery models, and clinical programs. In addition, we're going to look at the identification of multiple levers, strategies, and tools available to mitigate rising healthcare costs, and also how to do an in-depth understanding of a three-step analytical approach to identify key focus areas in order to facilitate potential cost reduction strategies. And we'll also look at a comprehensive strategy to address high cost elements utilizing the REDUCE model. And the idea here is to develop win-win solutions for both employers and employees and their unions. Thank you for your time. I hope that these webinars provide you with valuable guidance and practical solutions in addressing the many HR and labor challenges facing your organization.